Okay, we are live. Welcome to our audience for to the We Choose to Thrive interviews. All the ladies on this call are authors in our book, We Choose to Thrive. I'm Becky Norwood with The Woman I Love and also one of the authors in this book. We Choose to Thrive, our voices rising in unison to share a message of which share a message with abuse survivors of hope and inspiration for healing. So welcome, ladies, and welcome to our audience that's listening. I would like to start with you, Jane. Everybody, I would like you to have you briefly introduce yourself to the audience, tell a little bit about you, who you are, and um, then I'll be started. We'll start with our, our questions. Excellent. Hey, I'm Jane Powers, and I am in Phoenix, Arizona, originally from Chicago, Illinois. I am a speaker, coach, and an author, and a survivor. So when you hear one in three, I am that one. When you count that room, I am one of those survivors that have transformed my life into being a survivor. I am here today to welcome everybody into a world that you will view very differently. So I want to just welcome everybody who is joining us, and if you're hanging out, make sure you invite everybody else. But I am here just to have fun and to help you expand your mind and your heart and how you live your life. Thank you. Teresa? Hi, I'm Teresa Sims. I'm from Ontario, Canada, and we're having a lovely snowstorm today, which is nice. I am a, an author, a speaker, and a coach, an empowerment coach. I have been one of those one of three as well from very young, from toddler um, suffering psychological, physical, sexual abuse from family members, doctor, parents. It's just ridiculous the amount of abuse that goes on. But I'm here to tell the story, here to change how things are seen and to put an end to this completely. Thank you, Teresa. Deborah? Good morning, everyone. My name is Deborah Kniski, and I am in Edmonton, Alberta. And I am um, an entrepreneur as well, but I am also a survivor and a thriver. My company name is actually Blue Sky Thrivalist, which sort of fits in with all of this. And so I'm an author and inspirational speaker and um, just help people to strengthen the relationships with themselves so that they can come forward and um, make themselves live a better life instead of dealing with the abuse. Thank you, Deborah. Tessa. Hi, guys. My name is Tessa Milne. I am an inspirational speaker and a survivor of abuse. I spread awareness on the different forms of abuse, the cycle of abuse, and share resources. I work with police departments, victim advocates, teachers, and therapists. Um, I try to spread as much awareness as I possibly can. Um, I also work with children as well, uh, an organization here in Arizona that works with children from abuse. So I just feel like it's something that needs to be done, it needs to be said. People need to use their voices and realize that they have a voice and their voice matters. So that's why I do this. Thank you, Tessa. Karen? Hi. Um, I'm not a motiv motivational speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not a writer. Uh, I'm Karen Mason. Um, I live in a bedroom community off of Victoria on Vancouver Island, which is beautiful. We are having a bit of snow today, which is unusual. And I am a mother, and I am a wife, and I'm an entrepreneur. I have a financial planning practice here. And uh, I love horses. I love dogs. And I'm just here to share my story, if it can help anybody who's, who's, who's experienced domestic or, or um, physical or emotional and sexual abuse. Thank you, Karen, very much. And Soraya. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Soraya Pinkston, however, um, most known by Soraya Christine, which is the name that I write under. So I am a published author, um, as well as an inspirational speaker here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, do some traveling with that as well. My biggest goal is to help people to stop suffering in silence. Um, one of the things that people have unfortunately been trained with is sweeping things under the rug, and so I'm here to dispel that and to, to bust that wide open to be able to give people a voice um, and be able to speak out about the 
so that we can end the cycle. Um, I run a nonprofit organization called WATCH here in Las Vegas, Nevada, which stands for Why Are the Children Hurting? And we focus on sexual assault and domestic violence, of which I am both uh, have previously been a victim of since early childhood. And so my goal is really just to help people to understand that there is healing out there and you don't have to continue to suffer or to be a victim. Thank you, Soraya. So w we are here to, ch to thrive, and that's our message out to everyone that can hear this. I want to set the tone for the, for the questions that are going to be asked throughout this call or this um, interview. Bre Brene Brown said, I do not owe my, my past a place in my future. Amen. And I felt that that is such a powerful quote. And then Karen Salmason says, don't let the darkness from your past block the light of joy in your present. What happened is done. Stop giving time to things that no longer exist when there is so much joy to be found in the here and now. And one of the things, the reason I, I chose different quotes for each of our phone calls, our interviews, and the reason I chose that one is that while it still applies, if you are currently suffering from abuse and you are in a situation, please know that we want you to get help immediately, seek out help. For those that it's in their past and are still suffering, it still wears over them like a wet blanket, a heavy wet blanket, then that's, that, this, that is where we want to say choose to thrive. And we are here to give you some examples of some amazing stories, which we've done for the last two days, to give some amazing stories of courage and of heart. And I have to applaud each woman that has taken part in all of these interviews and in this book, because our message is that we can heal and don't be alone. So for our first question um, for this interview is, what prompted you to share your story with We Choose to Thrive? Soraya, we'll start with you. Uh, what prompted me to share my story with uh, you particularly, uh, you reached out to me um, and asked me to, and the reason that I said yes is because one, I really love the title, We Choose to Thrive. We have a choice to thrive, and that's what people need to understand, and so anything that um, helps people to understand that there is a choice in this matter was huge to me. I think that I commend you so greatly on that title for that book because people don't understand that they have options here. They have choices that they are able to make in their healing and their recovery process. And so I saw how huge this project was going to be. I could envision it. All of the women that are involved with their amazing stories, why Why would I not be a part of this? <laughs> oh, such a huge venture. Um, and again, just that, that choice, people have to understand that you have, you can make the decision to be healthy or not. And so I, I really, I really, um, that title, that title meant everything to me. Thank you. Very good. Deborah? I was prompted to share my story. Um, I actually shared my story first in 2015. I was in a go-nowhere job. I had a grade 9 education because I had quit school because of my abuse and my addictions that I was going through. And so I went back to school at the age of 39, and I was able to figure out that I had a voice and that I mattered, and that's why I decided to share my story, is because I want to be the person for other women that I needed in that time but did not have. And so that's why I shared my story, is to be that person Thank you. That's beautiful. Teresa? Um, I, I wanted to share my story. You um, asked me to be part of the book, um, and I actually started sharing my grandmother's story. Uh, that was the whole basis behind my book, was to write my grandmother's story, who had been uh, abused by her stepfather when she was 15 and died at 91 silent spoke nothing about it and to me it was to set her soul free but as I was writing my own story it became all about breaking the cycle of four generations of abuse and to stop that cycle completely in my family from happening to my sons or my grandchildren I wanted something better for my granddaughter and 
to stop the abuse and to tell everyone that we don't have to take this. We can't, we do not have to remain silent. You do have the choice. We all do have the choice. And the more messages we can get out about that, the more, um, the sooner this will stop. That's true. And, you know, and there's no, we see we have young, younger women here on this call. So that, so, and I am so proud. Yeah. <laughs> I am so proud that, that you chose at a younger age to come forward and say, you know, this is what's happened for me because, wow, the powerfulness of your life as you go forward. But, you know, if you're 90 and you just tell your story, good. Then the remaining years of your life will be so much more richer and happier. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And so it doesn't matter what age you are, where you are, it if you're ready, if you say this is enough, let's stand up and let's just um, let's change this world. Um, Tessa. Well, I came out with my story. I was, gosh, I think it was 31, and now I'm 34. But I decided that I wanted to step out, use my voice, because I didn't have anyone's success story to go off of when. I was a victim of abuse, and I went through a lot and almost died. And when I started to learn all of the different forms of abuse and the cycle and also the mindset of a victim and where the mindset of an abuser stems from, I thought, wow, like this is really intense. Mm -hmm. And this is something that people need to hear and they need to know and they need to learn the signs because if you don't know then how will you help or how will you be able to help yourself or help someone else so for me it was knowing that if if i had the success stories to go off of if i was told that there is a better life after abuse or if i was told that what i was going through was called abuse I don't think I would have um, been so close to death. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky to be able to be here today and say I am a survivor, but unfortunately there are so many other people that are not able to say that because they lost their life by the hands of their abuser. Mm -hmm. So for me, it is to spread awareness, sharing my survival story to inspire others and to motivate them to learn more and to help themselves or to help others. So having that information for myself, I'm not just going to keep it to myself. That's selfish. To me, that's just <laughs> selfish. So I figured I'm going to share this. I'm going to share this to everyone as much as I possibly can because abuse is more common than people realize. It's in so many different forms. And there's a cycle. And I ended the cycle of abuse because of the knowledge. And I want other people to be able to do the same thing. So it's basically, it's life or death. That is. To tell you the truth, it's life or death, and that's why I am now stepping out. And just like Jane had said before, like <laughs> I have been uh, accused of lying. I have been threatened. I've had to get an attorney for myself so that I could learn my rights and how I can actually speak out and what I can say because those people that are trying to stop me, they might be abusers. And they will do anything in their power to stop someone. I keep the silence. Yes, exactly. So I also want to put that out there, too. An abuser is going to do and say anything that they possibly can so that victims and other victims will not gain their own power and move on and be strong. So I think that spreading awareness on that is huge. And it might take a while for people to understand it, but I am ready to plant that seed over and over and over again. Because one day, it will click. So mm -hmm. that's, and it took a while for me, so I completely understand, and that's why I do it. We do. You know, we've talked a lot about the generational issue how the, the abuse often goes yeah. through generations of family. And um, one day about two, 
it was not even two weeks before my father took his life, who he was the perpetrator. He looked at me and he just shook his head and he says, you've broken the cycle in our family. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, you are not abusive to your children. This is amazing. And he, so that was, that was his greatest gift. Out of everything he had done in his whole life, that was his greatest gift to me. Yeah, that's actually really huge. <laughs> yeah, it is. And Karen, why did you choose to share? <laughs> well, uh, you and I met a year, just a, just a little under a year ago at a women's retreat held by none other than Joe Dibley at Brocalicious. Mm -hmm. And we shared our stories, and I was really inspired by your courage. Um, not long after we had spoken, a friend of mine had posted on Facebook in June about um, the assaults that were happening on campuses and such, and, and talking about uh, sexual assault. And I, uh, I posted on her post about a small part of my experience. And as soon as I had done that, I just went into this white knuckle fear. And I'm like, oh, what have I done? What have I done? It's public. I got to take it down. And when I went to go take it down, she had already seen it and she already commented on it. So I had to private message her and go, I need ah. to take it. Yeah, like, what? I didn't mean it. Take it down, take it down. And she dragged me down this rabbit hole of what are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. And I had never actually, so this is really new for me, I had never actually been, um, made my story public. I could tell a close friend one-on-one -on -one about what happened, um, and it, along with my, my uh, marriage of domestic violence, I could talk to one-on-one -on -one with women about that, but it was nothing I ever considered making public. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting dragged down this rabbit hole of, what are you ashamed of? What are you fearful of? And that's when I thought, okay, so now I'm facing it. <laughs> <laughs> and I just decided at that time that uh, I chose to participate and take uh, Becky's role of um, being inspirational, hopefully, and truly putting it out there so I can help others uh, who are in either, in, have been assaulted or in a domestic relationship that's very violent or violent to, to help them get out and just to know that it's more common and you can you can heal and you can get out. And we're so proud of you. You've made, I've watched you grow too through this time spring and I'm so proud of you. We're all proud of you. Okay, Jane. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I have been sharing my story, like I said, since 19, we're probably the more senior people on here, Becky, since 1980 something. And I, here's what my goal, my goal is to make this the new normal. It, it's like having a conversation and saying, oh, I'm gluten free or I am sexually abused. It, it, we're making it, you know, over the generations, it's always been the best kept secret, the silent scream, the don't, you know, don't show because there's a lot of consequences that come back on us. For example, you know, why didn't we stop it? We are, you know, there's, I don't care how old we were. I had that thought. Well, why couldn't I stop it? Well, I was like this teeny kid. So I think there's such a taboo around the subject of it because there is such a self-induced shame or blame that it really isn't the best thing for us to be able to step into and, and live out loud and proud about it. So I, I want it to become the new normal because if it is one in three, which we know, I think those statistics are conservative, but I think it's so important to find our voice. And I had, believe it or not, believe it or not, I grew up very shy, quiet, and the invisible kid. I did not want to be seen or heard, and I did not want attention drawn to me. I didn't stay in one area of friends too long, because what if they found out the truth? What if they found out what was really going on behind the country club family? I mean, I was in a country club with the poorest family in the world emotionally, and I decided I was not going to keep the secret, not because I wanted to show the world or, you know, stop the perpetrators. That was part of it, but the truth was I was dying inside because I was holding a secret that was literally, you know, metaphorically killing me. Mm -hmm. and it weighs I, too heavy. Yeah, it's too much, and it's a lot of responsibility, and it's not even our responsibility. It's the responsibility of the perpetrators that we are actually, you know, many times, I was protecting the reputation of my family. My father was very successful. I mean, I didn't want, I didn't want to have that, you know, be the teller of truth, 
because there were consequences around it. And and I am not by I am by far not this rebel radical going out and going, damn those abusers. Basically what I say is find your voice, find your power, and you find your freedom. So many, many years ago, sitting on Oprah Winfrey, I found my freedom and I have not stopped telling the story and I have not stopped when I was working with kids in I was doing speaking in front of 200, 300 kids about abuse. They would come up to me, and, and my mother had died of alcoholism as, you know, when I was a kid, and they're like, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't do drugs, you're not a prostitute, you've never been locked up, you've never been suicidal, I'm going to grow up to be just like you. Mm-hmm. And I never yeah. stopped telling this story because thousands of kids, I used to say, set your aspirations a little higher, but thousands <laughs> of kids wanted to grow up to be just like me, and what that was was free, and they found their voice. So my main point is I want want women, even if it's just to tell their best friend in confidence or they want to stand on stage and say, you know what, the world is going to change. I want to teach people there's a new way to survive and there's a new way to express yourself in safety and in confidence. Beautiful. Very good. Nashe, yay, you got here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm here. (laughs) Thank you. Um, You want to introduce yourself real quick and then the first question is what? Um, after you introduce, tell us a little bit about you, is what prompted you to share your story with us? Um, so my name is Nishay Martinez. I am in the Bay Area, California. Um, growing up from the age of nine until I was 18, uh, my grandfather abused me, raped me uh, repeatedly. And um, it kind of was like a revelation Later down in my life, uh, I have memory repression, and um, I have been diagnosed with disassociative identity disorder, uh, so a mild form of it. Um, so I kind of just forget traumatizing, um, traumatizing events in my life. It just is like a click, like, okay, well, let's, let's leave now. Um, and uh, the reason why I decided to share my story is actually going through the process of um, finally coming to terms with it and healing myself and taking him to court many, 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 many years later and having to go through that whole court process. The court process is so difficult and re-traumatizing and um, it's kind of just showing support and showing other women and men that they can get through it and kind of give a voice of reason, maybe not necessarily a reason, but kind of a voice for people that are scared to come forward or scared that they're going to be judged and that there's more than just them. They're not alone. Um, And that's kind of why I decided to share my story. Very cool. I mean, yours was with your, your grandfather and after you went through the whole court thing, you, um, he only had, he was given, what, three years? And he only had to serve 18 months? Yeah. yeah. That sounds familiar. But the courage that you had to do that, and I know you talked about that piece of it, that when you got up to read your statement, that sometimes even today you read your statement to remember the courage that you had at that moment. So yeah. proud of you. Thank you. Very, very cool. So my next question is, in your own process of healing, what's been your greatest oh. obstacle? And I'll start with you, Teresa. My greatest obstacle would have been my own fear. My own fear of being seen. My own fear of being heard. Uh, When I was young, I was very loud and in everybody's space. (laughs) Totally opposite to what I am now. Uh, It was... I fought back when I was young. As I got older, the fight was almost taken out of me. And I just stopped speaking up. I just regressed and just, you know, I I didn't want to be heard. I didn't want anyone to know. Even those that I did tell, they didn't care. Or it seemed that they didn't care. So I just stopped saying anything. So I guess it was myself. I had to step out of myself, step out of my own way and make myself heard. And I'm just doing that now. It's taken a long time. More power to you. Proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Deborah. My biggest obstacle, I would say, 
Um, because I was sexually assaulted and neglected and abused in every form until I was 19 years old, I think the biggest obstacle was facing all of it in one sitting while I was writing my book. I was so afraid that although my perpetrators were no longer with us, um, I was still afraid of the repercussions that were going to come from my story because my mother is still alive. And she, of course, declines all of my statements and says that I'm lying. But um, she, she needed, I, I think she needs to um, write her own story about her own abuses as well. This will, but for me, I would say it was the fear of mm -hmm. people judging me. And I just moved forward and said, you know what, the only person who can judge me is myself. And mm -hmm. nobody else's opinion matters because I know I'm telling the truth and I know it's going to help at least one person step onto their story instead of into it. Very cool. Yes, very good. And Tessa? Obstacles. Um, I face obstacles every day, <laughs> but... Um, because I have PTSD, um, I speak on that a lot because a lot of victims of survivors of abuse have PTSD and it's not talked about very often. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, even survivors have triggers and it's learning that coping mechanism because not everybody has the same yeah. coping mechanism. So from the very beginning for me, it was, my first obstacle was being able to tell my story and not cry. Because when I, when I first started, I would cry because I was still not completely sure of myself. And, which is pretty normal, mm -hmm. but, or common. But um, it's understanding that I'm okay now and I'm not going to let anyone ever touch me again and being able to portray that to other people as well it's <laughs> I guess I have a sort of a, a tough skin now which I'm perfectly fine and okay with and I get emotional when I hear other people's stories so I'd say that's one of the biggest obstacles right now for me but I also understand that they've come so far too and they're alive and they're good and they're still learning themselves as well everybody it's a process the the healing process doesn't happen overnight and i don't think i will ever be completely healed because of the triggers and the memories, the emotions that I feel for other people as well. Now, I don't cry when I tell my story because I've, I've come to a place where I've accepted that I'm okay now. It's in the past. The past is in the past. I'm not reliving it anymore. It's me just sharing what I went through, my experiences to help other people. So I would say every day is, is still... There's always going to be an obstacle, and I'm always learning from these obstacles. So, I appreciate your sharing, and yes, there are triggers, and it's becoming, when you realize there are triggers, it's becoming aware of them and putting steps in place to, to kind of, how do I deal with that trigger, and develop things that you can do that around that that will help you to not go seek maybe as deep as you did the time before. Right. You know, to, to if you have to f find what it is, if it's breaking out in a fun song, doing some kind of happy thing, going for a walk, do something, read a good book, um, remove yourself from where you are in that thing. There are things you can do to start making those, even the trigger points, better. Exactly. And, and which okay. is what you've done. Yeah. yeah. Could I just add a comment to that about yeah. the PTSD? I would definitely agree with that for sure. And I was not aware that I had experienced PTSD from abuse until I was sought treatment for help for PTSD from a near-death car accident. That's what I sought help for. And then I realized through the hypnotherapy process that the PTSD was actually there 
from my childhood. Every trauma I went through was just being relived. And it was a huge process to be able to cope with that, not cope with it, but learn to acknowledge it um, and deflate the triggers. Right. Um, It's huge. It It is is huge. Nishay. Um, God, so many obstacles. (laughs) 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 Um, For me, I think I was probably the biggest obstacle and not necessarily like the memory of repression was a big one just not knowing if I was my flashbacks were real and not thinking and thinking oh you know because telling people in in my family and they're they're saying well maybe you're just dreaming about it or maybe it could have happened I don't know and trying to come to terms with the fact that it was real and then after realizing that it is real realizing that everything in my life that has happened to me whether it's like suicidal tendencies or cutting or just PTSD or the DID and that all lumps from the instance of me being abused that to me was like probably the biggest obstacle is that all of this is connected to what had happened and trying to deal with it not necessarily as a whole but individually trying to figure out triggers and trying to figure out like what really sets things off especially for DID um, and trying to I mean I'm still coping with it as far as all of those issues that I have but trying to separate them and trying to see them each as an individual like effect of this cause. Okay. Thank you. Soraya? Obstacles. Um, I have faced quite a few obstacles. I first told my story in 2012, which is when my personal book first came out. Um, and that's how most of the people that have known me my entire life found out about the abuses that I've been through. Um, and so the biggest challenge in that was my mom. I actually sent my mom the book before it even came out. Um, because there was a lot, you know, a lot of it involved her. Um, I blamed her for a lot of things and there was a lot, um, a lot of stuff that she didn't even realize, you know, that I was holding on to all of those years. And so I had to kind of mend the relationship with her, um, and help her to understand that I forgave her for the things that I faulted her for. Um, so that was a huge obstacle, um. And like Nishay said, me, I, I was one of my biggest obstacles because I had to learn how to love me. Typically we are. <laughs> I had to figure out, how, matter, as a matter of fact, I had to figure out how to like me. Um, forget about love. I had to figure out how to like me. Um, I had gone through an extended period. I'm 42 years old now. And so the abuse started when I was five. Um, and I've gone through so many types of abuse since then, um, not to mention rape, sexual assault, and domestic violence um, on top of the molestations. So I've experienced a lot, and I've learned how to, like she said, also disassociate myself. And I've learned how I, I lost emotion during that time. So I had to figure out how to regain that, how to regain emotion, and how to um, learn love, and how to accept myself and how to get past the fear of rejection and the things that come along and how to how to learn how to build relationships i had no clue how to build relationships even like friendships i had no idea how to build friendships and how to maintain them because i wasn't able to connect with people on that level you know so those were the biggest obstacles for me and those are things that i'm literally just now learning how to to do, learning how to come out of in the last few years even, just learning how to, you know, develop relationships and maintain those relationships, whether it be intimate partner relationships or just, you know, personal friendships, um, family member relationships. It was it was very difficult to to be able to have those and have them on a deep level because I didn't I wasn't able to connect. Right. And so those were my biggest obstacles, just learning how to forgive, learning how to connect. Um, how to love yourself. Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Karen? Uh, well, myself, 
being in front of myself. Um, when I left my ex-husband, uh, I actually thought he was going to kill me. I, that's, that's the path we were going on. I mean, the violence was escalating. And when I left him, I thought, okay, I'm gone now. I'm over it. Compartmentalize it. He's out of my life. And so, and that, and with the previous assaults that happened in my life, I just put them in a tidy, neat little box. It was over. It was past. It was history. And I just parked it. I just didn't feel a need to revisit it. And what happened was, is I think, I well, what I know, what I'm finding out currently, like I'm in the process now, is that I really shut down, and it's it has really affected my ability to be vulnerable. Because I don't want to be seen. Somebody else mentioned on today's call they didn't want to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, that's the hardest part for me is, is coming out with this, is being seen. Um, you know, fear, humiliation, judgment, rejection. Uh, even today, if anybody raises their voice to me, even slightly, I go into straight into fear. I, I cannot deal. Well, I don't like raised voices. Not that we should. But, boy, I go, I go right into flight when somebody raises their voice with me. So it's um, – I am now realizing just as this book was launching when it was really in my face that, oh, this is public. <laughs> <laughs> this is public now. You're not hiding anymore. Um, it is being vulnerable with it. And uh, that, is, that is what I'm working on right now. Uh, and we honor you with your vulnerability. We understand that. Okay, Jane. Uh, let's see, greatest obstacle, always the theme of my life is me getting my own way. It, it's really <laughs> interesting as I'm listening to everybody, I have so many thoughts around the obstacle. My biggest obstacle was not the, the flight, was the fight. I, I became a fighter. I would, there's no way, no how anybody was going to take advantage of me again. So I, you know, my knee-jerk reaction many times is I come in with a loud voice, with that fight, and, and you can't tell now because I look very tall on screen, but I'm pretty sure. She's pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I am, I am determined and I show up with big energy. But early on, early on, the biggest thing was, and I, I can't remember who was saying it, but the biggest thing was knowing I wasn't a liar. You know, I was told, oh, my God, you have a great imagination. I thought, oh, then I must have made all this up because I was the youngest of seven. Nobody else had any tales like I did. So I had a lot of evidence not supporting me, not going, oh, yeah, you know, that's what happened. Now, two of my sisters were like, on board, yes, absolutely, and very supportive. Well, it was me doubting me. How could that happen? How could the members of my family do this, and especially my father? So really going through and doubting myself, that was probably my biggest struggle. Another struggle, and this is so how I live my life, is find your voice, find your power. I worked diligently in therapy to find my voice. They were like, you have got to scream because you've never screamed. And I would, I mean, I would bust blood vessels holding back the, the terror that was in my system. So a lot of it was self-doubt was not, you know, seeing myself as a liar. And I'll tell you, the, one of the biggest things that I dealt with, because there was a number of different modalities, I guess you would call it, of abuse, um, I had the hardest time with oral. Like, that was the biggest shame point for me. Do anything from the neck down, but anything up, oh, it was just something I could not tolerate. And there's a part of me that that felt worse than anything else. So it was my own judgment of what does it mean? That was another obstacle is the shame and the guilt. And this is the worst thing, and nobody talks about this. There was a part of me, and I know, and I've worked with many survivors counseling and doing interventions. There is a part of a survivor or a victim that it, it sounds crazy, but there's a part of us that actually enjoys it. Now, we're not like, oh, this is awesome. I'll tell you. When my father came to pick me, I was special. Uh, and I, I was abused from zero on up through high school. And I was special. That was his way of saying, I love you the best. Sick as heck. But as a child, my little brain was like, oh, my gosh, I'm being chosen. I'm the one. So it's very confusing, which then goes into the adult life where you're like, what is love? And this is a big thing when my book comes out and when my work comes out. It's about how do we do 
thrivership in our adult life. And many, and including myself, were in these wonderful, very nice relationships. And for me, my intimacy was supposed to be secret, anonymous, the more dangerous, the better. And I'm in a very nice, conservative relationship. And it messes you up, or it messed me up, because I was like, hey, I might not want to be that conservative. But I shamed myself into believing I should be. And I'll tell you, adult survivors, I think that's one of our biggest issues. How do we just live out loud in every realm and not go, oh, well, you're, you know, you're a deviant or you are this. And, and so my, my biggest challenge in my adult life, I should say in the last maybe 10, 15 years, had been keeping the lid on that pot that was boiling. To really express who I am and how I want to live without saying, if I'm living what a deviant life, like, you know, and that might just be being creative in your intimate relationship, in a monogamous intimate relationship, and being creative, and we may, you know, survivors are like, oh, that means I am that. And, it, and it's so, it's such a mind-blowing experience when you go, oh my gosh, it's just a freedom of expression. So I think my greatest challenge you know, and, and I know you can't tell, but I am 54, and I started telling this truth when I was 21. So I have been, I it's have It's a been, journey. It's a journey, and, and I'll tell you, you know, it's, I think Tessa said, I'll never heal. And, you know, we always have that, you know, I always say sexual abuse, the gift that keeps on giving, because it will be with us forever, but it's how we relate to it. It's how we relate to the triggers of I'm not worthy, or I am that kid. And I always say, we are not what happened to us, and we are not what was told to us, and we are so much more. But I, And I don't care if it was sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional neglect. We all have that thing. I used to wish, I wish I would have been beaten. Like, just beat the hell out of me. Don't sexually abuse me, because then it's just, it felt easier to me. I, people would say, oh, I was abused. I'm like, oh, man, I wish I was just beaten. And it would just, it would just be easier. And I think it's an added layer for people coming out to say, oh, my God, I think this happened to me. It's an added layer of shame and, and dirty, deviant, all the different things that go with it. So uh, my greatest struggle is ever changing. And I don't say it as a struggle anymore. My greatest opportunity for expansion is every trigger that gives me a new awareness of one more piece that I get to soothe and heal. I think that um, you brought up one point that is really, really interesting and what was one of my aha moments was um, we, you and I were having a conversation, Karen, and when we met and it was kind of, we were back and forth sharing in what I did not understand and what grieved me so much and what was so painful is why did I enjoy the sexual part of it, the sexual molestation, but it was way better for me than the beatings were and the other things. And it was the only time that was treated with some kind of kindness. And it, it just used to just hurt so deeply because why would I want, why would I say, how could I even verbalize that? Mm -hmm. And it didn't make sense in my heart. And I felt so much shame around it and didn't know how to, how to put it together. But it was in that conversation we had sitting out there on that little porch talking that one evening that just was like the light bulbs came on and I, oh, that's what it was. And so there's so many layers and facets of all of this. There truly is. So very cool. May, may I add another aha moment, Becky, just quickly? Mm -hmm. just very quickly is um, when I started sharing my story, and of course I read, I read other women's stories and I've been talking with our good friend Joe about things and I never thought my story was really worth telling because it was nothing compared to anybody else's. It wasn't as violent or as bad or as life-threatening or as horrific as other women's stories. And Joe said something to me that was really interesting. She says, Karen, because your story was your normal. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, oh, I, I get that now. Because my, it doesn't matter um, how bad or not bad your story is. It's still your story, and, it's, and it still hurts. It still colors your world. Yeah, yeah I... Yeah. I'd like to add to that too, where, you know, I would tell people, oh, well, it, I was just like molested and raped by my grandparent, like grandfather for like a few years. And they would be like, 
that's not normal. Like, and I'm like, well, it wasn't that bad. Like he didn't like beat me or he didn't like hurt. Like he just, like, it was just sexual assault. And they're like, no, that's not normal. Like <laughs> you don't understand. Like that's not something that is, oh, it was just, and I think that makes a lot of sense too. It's like, I didn't even think like, oh, that is my normal or that was my normal growing up. And so people are just like, no, no, no. Like, please share your story because that's not like, it is normal, but it's not normal. Like it's normal because of the society we live in, because that's just what we live in, but it shouldn't be normalized. Like that's not something that we should go ahead and allow people to be like, oh, well, I was just beaten and raped. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is that in every single interview that I've had for this book, and we did the Zoom interviews one-on-one -on -one to, to talk, I have learned so much about myself through this process it, from every woman I've learned. But I've also learned that abuse is abuse no matter what kind of abuse, and no matter the how horrible or not horrible it may seem to somebody else's abuse may seem to me there's no way to measure how it affects us well it's and amazing I, we I can't it's, compare it's amazing how we how people have compare paranoia mm -hmm. in their survivorship we're like oh well mine's way worse than yours or you know i mean i've been in conversation with <laughs> yeah, they'll be like, well, oh, one or two times. Well, mine was every day. Like, I mean, you know, because people would hear my story and they'll be, and they would, they would quiet down their stories because they minimize it or they don't have memories. Yeah. You know, I, I happen to be one of the individuals that have the majority of the memories. And some people like, I don't remember, so it's not true. And it's like we compare our level of suffering. Like, can, can, can my life be this much of a mess? No, I have no reason to be. I don't care if it just intimated some level of an objective occlusion. Abuse is abuse, like you were saying, no matter what level. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Can paranoia, it is, the, it is the destruction of any healing, in my opinion. It is. Teresa, what was your aha moment? <laughs> I, my aha moment would have been when I started writing about my grandmother and then it switched to be about me. When the weight started lifting off of my shoulders, I couldn't believe how much of a burden I have been carrying for almost 57 years. It's ridiculous. When that weight started lifting, it was it was so freeing it was my life had purpose all of a sudden and yes i compared myself to a lot of people because it's just the way we are it's just what we've always done and and it's not we should not do it honestly it's it's terrible that we do that but um for me it was just realizing that I had to stop it. I had to honestly stop it to protect my grandchildren. And when I, I met a cousin that I didn't know I had, and he was suffering the same thing. There's so many generations of my family that are suffering from the same thing. And there's a, a section of us that are putting our foot down and saying, we have to stop this we're not going to stand for this anymore. And it gave me power. It gave me courage. It gave me determination. And then to know that people would actually listen to what I had to say was incredible. And for me, it was just, I have to tell the story. I, if I can help one other person, mm -hmm. then my mission is complete. Yes, very much so. I, I just got a, a message from somebody that was on the interview yesterday. She said a relative just viewed the, the interview from yesterday. One of her relatives did and said that don't forget the, per, the perpetrators are the victims too. Yes. And she said she just kind of, she's really having a hard time processing that. What would you say to something like that? I would agree. 
my oh. father was my main source of abuse uh, abuser and he was violently abused abused by his stepfather and his mother and you grow up with that you don't know sometimes any better and it just becomes a way of life almost doesn't make it right but that's what happens and my father was trying to fight the demons within himself by because of his past he drank an awful lot he was quite an alcoholic and that's when he started um it, doing his form of abuse towards me and uh, oh sorry go ahead no <laughs> go ahead Ms. Shea. yeah um, I think there are, I mean, obviously the cycle of abuse is very prominent as far as re, just redoing the abuse that was onto you, onto other people. Uh, but that's only half, I feel like it's only half. Like my mm -hmm. grandfather was just a sick person and he is not a victim. He is definitely not a victim. He definitely understood what he was doing and he definitely, like, I think, I think that is probably the biggest thing for me as an obstacle when it comes to other people is like, oh, well, what was wrong with your grandfather? Like, obviously something happened to him. Well, don't take away from like what happened to me because you feel, you could not feel bad for him. He is not like, it just, he's not a victim. He's the criminal and he is the perpetrator and he is the one that is sick. And I think people who have not experienced any kind of abuse in their life like it's very hard for them to understand why somebody would do that whether it was a cycle or if it's just that that's something that makes them happy and uh, putting them in the victim category makes it as an excuse like oh well they treated you like that because somebody else treated them like that mm -hmm. and in reality, if they were in that system as far as the abuse, they should understand how it makes them feel. Maybe not necessarily to a complete understanding like we do because we all had epiphanies and had therapy probably, <laughs> or at least I did. I had a lot, I have a lot of therapy, but putting them in that same category kind of puts them next to me and that makes me mad. Soraya, you wanted to say something? Oh, goodness, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I want to say two things. Cause we I'm, can't, you need to turn up your volume. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Barely. Uh, let me see. Okay, while she's fixing that, um, that, does anybody else want to address that? Yeah, I would love to address that because I, I think... I think if you just, I mean, I know this sounds trite, but we're all victims to something, whether it's some jerk on the road or some jerk in our family. I think, like, I, I had confronted my father many, many years ago and went through a very long process with him, you know, till he died about, I don't know, a year and a half ago. Um, I think they're victims of the need for control. They're victims of the need to to satisfy their desire to control, whether it's sexually um, through power, through whatever, but I think it's all, I think it's all about, and you could say victim, or they could just be sick, it doesn't matter, I think, I think, um, you know, as, are they innocent bystanders of it, did they have the choice, absolutely, I, I believe they had the choice, but they were so drawn, my father, I look at my father, and my other perpetrators, were so drawn for the need for control, and, and our innocence was so easy for them to scoop up the control. And I used to work in the prison system. And I had to sit across from perpetrators and work with them. And I tell you, the mindset, their self-esteem is so incredibly low that the innocence of a kid lifts them up. So I think they're a victim to their own self-loathing, self-hatred, and self-concept. And, you know, does it put them in the same category? I think it's, I think it's a different category. You know, did we have the choice? Absolutely not. Could we fight? No. I mean, I tried to fight one time, and boy, I woke up real quick. You don't do that. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I look at my father. Was my father abused by his dad? He said he was, and 
you know, my grandfather abused me. Could that be true? Yeah, but he was a very successful man that was out in the community. We grew up in the country club. Is there, you know, can people look at him and go, oh, he's a victim? No, but inside, I'll tell you, he was held prisoner and hostage by his own illness. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. You're able to hear me? Okay. Um, Jane, thank you. You actually touched on a lot of what I was going to say. Um, already, already. I felt you. I felt you. <laughs> I was just going to say it kind of, and I kind of feel like, um, I'm sorry, I don't want to mess her name up again. Um, but it, it kind of makes me angry when people call the predator the victim. And granted, I understand uh, generational curses. I understand cycles. I understand all of that very well. However, I also understand choice. And people make the decisions that they want to make. It's really just that simple. Because you can opt not to touch me as a five-year-old child. You can make that decision. And so the, the fact that these perpetrators made the decision to become perpetrators does not put them in victim category. Victim category is that 5, 7, 10, 11-year-old child that didn't have any choice in the matter. And so it makes me very upset when people try to make excuses for perpetrators. And that's a classic victim mentality. I look at my daughter, for instance, my daughter's 19 now, and she went recently through a domestic violence situation that I had to help her out of. And, you know, one of the things that she kept saying throughout that is, is you know, that she feels bad and he spent some time in prison for stalking her. And she's like, oh, I kind of feel bad that he had to spend that much time in jail. That doesn't even make sense to me. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to feel, I don't feel bad at all. What I feel bad about is the person who molested me only got 18 months in prison. That's what I feel bad about because he molested me for four years. So I feel bad that you only spent 18 months behind bars, but you're definitely not a victim. And so it makes me quite angry um, when people try to, to, to put them in the same category. If they were victims in their childhood, uh, you know, it's sad. It's sad that they were victims in their childhood, but that doesn't cause it because I've never abused any of my kids. Right. <laughs> so we have decisions that we make. So we need to, to move this along, and I appreciate all of your comments, and it, it's, it's one of those that go deeply emotional, and we honor each one for their own specific feelings. But um, what words of wisdom? I'm going to start with you, Teresa. What words of wisdom would you share with somebody that's just choosing to go this path of, I, I, it's time for me to heal? I would tell them to uh, be gentle with themselves. Take the time. Be slow. Find the right help. Find the, the help that actually, the person that can help you. Make sure that they resonate with you, that they are there to help you. And just learn to heal your soul first. Everything else can come later. But that's, that's what's helped me is to heal myself first. Be, be gentle, be strong, be courageous, but be loving. And love yourself most of all. Absolutely. Yeah. Deborah. My words of wisdom would be do it and to do it fearlessly because you're not alone. You are surrounded. You just don't know it yet. And once you reveal your story, you will understand how more, many people are surrounding you and loving you and nurturing you through your situation. So stand up, do it fearlessly. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tessa? I always tell people that abuse is preventable and change is possible with the proper support, guidance, inspiration, and awareness. Because I feel like that's how I've learned and how common abuse really is. Almost everyone you know has gone through some form of abuse. And coming together and sharing any kind of knowledge that you have on the info with everybody. Because if you don't particularly know someone that has gone through some kind of abuse, that person might. So just spread awareness as much as you possibly can and educate yourself. Um, there are tons of resources that are out there that people don't even know about. Right. 
um, for different forms of abuse. And because not everybody has gone through the same form of abuse, everyone has their own situations that they've gone through. So there are so many organizations that have been formed because of the different forms of abuse that are out there. And also, um, almost every police department has a victim advocate. So contact your local police department and ask for a victim advocate, whether you're a victim or you know someone who is, and continue to educate yourself. Learn as much as you possibly can and just share it and spread it like wildfire. Thank That's you. what I have to say. Perfect. <laughs> Nishay? Um, to piggyback off of Tessa, I, I actually am a victim advocate, and I would say that that's probably, for me being a survivor and helping survivors, that's probably like one of the biggest things that I absolutely loved and it helped has helped me so much is just helping women get through this process and as a victim witness or a victim advocate, you're you're the first point of contact normally after the assault. And so just being able to sit there with somebody because I didn't have anybody to sit there with me. Right. And mm -hmm. I didn't know what was going on. And so being able to sit there with somebody and kind of like be the person, be the support that I wanted in my life is like so powerful but also the same time like um when it comes to i just had to say that because victim advocates are very far and few in between when it comes to just people wanting to sit in the hospital and want, like watch a rape kit being done that's not very fun but it makes a big impact um but i would have to say actually that uh reach out there is so much support and find somebody that you trust to talk to and it doesn't have to be the police it doesn't have to be hospital it doesn't have to be anybody official just find somebody that you can that can support you and get you through it all very cool thank you soraya i have actually three uh, three small pieces of wisdom that i would like to leave um one um is two of them actually is what helped me kind of my aha moments as you were talking about before we can't hear you again oh can you hear me now no. Just speak up. Okay. It says it's working. Yes? Go ahead and speak up the best you can. Okay. So one is not to wallow in unforgiveness. Um, you have to learn how to forgive. One of the things that I first heard when I first started on this journey was that un unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That stuck with me um, through this journey. And um, I wanted to leave that with you. Uh, the other thing is stop suffering in silence. Talk to someone, like Michelle was just saying, find someone that you can trust to talk to and get it out of you. Even if you just have to start by writing it down on paper, um, do that just to be able to get it out because you don't want to continue to harbor hurt. Um, and then the last thing is, uh, I heard very clearly um, a, a still small voice speaking to me early on saying, this isn't about you. And although that shook me to my core, it made me realize that I went through all of this stuff and I survived all of this stuff so that I could help somebody else to be able to get through it. So it's not about me. It's about helping other people to heal who may not otherwise have the opportunity to get through this as a survivor. Um, and so that's, that's it. That's all I wanted to leave. Thank you. Thank you. Karen? Yes, I would say don't believe them. Don't believe like the woman in my office that told me I deserved the assault from my manager. Like my husband who told, yeah. <laughs> my husband who told me I was worthless every day, who beat me and made me feel like the worst human being that could have possibly lived and how he put me down, how he denied what he did. I, I don't believe all the horrible things and the names that they call you. Don't buy into it. Don't believe them. Surround yourself, surround yourself in people that, that bring you up, that hold you up, that believe you and support you and also kick you in your, in your butt when you start to wallow. It's really important that they don't buy your BS. 
they're there for you to lift you up and help you and support you. Uh, but just don't believe the bad words because that's their words. If they have, like the, our previous um, guest here, their words have nothing to do with you. It has to do with how they probably, I don't want to psychoanalyze them, but it has nothing to do with you. So don't believe them. Thank you. All right, Jane, and we have to wind it down. I have another one just starting in just a couple of minutes. All right, all right. So here's my, everything everybody has said, but I'm going to give you a couple of different things. One, buy the book. We Choose to Thrive. Buy the book because in every one of those stories, in every one of our stories, there's a tip on how to thrive. And I, my biggest tip is stand up, speak up, and play fall out. Because if you don't stand up and speak up, you don't find your power. And live in your shame. Live in your blame. Don't stifle the process. But also feel sad. Feel mad. Feel glad. Feel all the feelings that are associated with survivorship and decide to give a kind glance to the details. And I've got a lot of details. And I spent therapy. I go into therapy. I've come out sweating crying and I'd be like, that was a good one. Because man, I rewounded and felt the pain. And I'll tell you, it took a lot of years for me to realize I don't need to rewound. I don't need to stay in that. I need to give it a kind glance, give it a voice and, that and stand up and start to speak out and make this our new normal. Make it normal that it's, oh, I'm gluten free and, and who cares what people think and what they say. It's our own shame that gets triggered. So stand in confidence stand in clarity and stand in freedom of who you are, what you've lived through. And again, I, you know, I always say, drop the F-bomb, forgiveness. It's the worst <laughs> word for a survivor when people said you need to forgive. I'm like, I'll give you the other F-word, not forgiveness either. And I'll tell you, it is the, it is not, doesn't have to be done right away, but at some point you got to say, well, that sucked and. So you know what? Abuse sucks. It's inconvenient and. You can thrive. Buy the book. I just have to say that. Love yourself. Love yourself. And on behalf of all of you here, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I have to shut, um, shut this off. But thank you for being here. And on behalf of our audience, choose to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.